I have come to my fellow Romans to explain to you a testimony and a report of what has happened a few weeks ago at the jail of Philippi, at the Philippian jail that I am the jailer of. And I need to point out, first of all, that it is absolutely true. Despite what rumors may be going on, what you might have heard, it is absolutely true that we did appropriately and improperly treat Roman citizens. It is not something that I am proud of, and if we had only known that they were Roman citizens, we would have treated them better. But alas, that was not the case. But it is true that we found these men that was Silvanus and Paul of Tarsus, yes, Roman citizens, that we found these men, that they were viewed as having broken some laws. It is true that they were beaten, that they were flogged, that they were whipped and stripped naked. And it is true that they were handed over to me, the jailer, to be able to be put into prison, to be put into a jail, into a secure place. That was my instruction was to keep them absolutely secure. And so I put them into the stocks in the center of the jail where I keep the murderers and the thieves and the worst of the worst, where they are not only chained, but they're also bound in stockade. That's where I put them. If I had only known that they were Roman citizens, I would have, I would have treated them differently. If I had only known, and isn't it funny how that happens sometimes. We see someone, they're dressed a certain way, they look a certain way, they behave a certain way, and we cast a judgment upon them. Whether it's the color of their skin or whether it's because of how they're dressed or how dirty or clean shaven they are, we cast a judgment and then we treat them accordingly. And then we find out that they have lots of money. And then we find out that they attend our church. Then we find out that they got lots of degrees or they're in our class. Then we go, oh my word, if I had only known, I would have treated you differently. But maybe that means we should have treated them differently in the first place. And so it is to my regret that I saw these men as second class, no, no, worse than that. I saw them as scum. I saw them as not even worthy to even untie my shoes. I saw them as not even worthy to be able to even approach me. I saw them as just animals, maybe even not even that well, that we treated them as poorly as we could have treated them. Well, I can tell you the Philippian jail no longer operates that way, not under my watch, but I digress. So there they were in jail. And I'm telling you right now, this was something, in case you're wondering why I would even give in to something like this, why I would be so passionate about these two. Let me tell you why, because I know you asked. Well, I know, not verbally, because you're respectful, but I can see it in your faces. I know you asked. Why would you even treat someone like this? Well, here's the thing. I am not someone that has always been a well-respected individual within my family. See, my family consists of brothers who were generals, fathers who were, father who was a commander, people who were great high ups in society. And then look at me. I could barely fill my armor. Look at me. I could, I could, I could hula hoop with a Cheerio. <laughs> you can put a dime on my head and people will confuse me for a nail. Okay, in fact, when I tried to enlist into the military, you know what happened? The general came up to me. He spat and he goes, boy, I seen more meat on an anorexic chicken. And so I, I know, I'm just, I couldn't be cut out to be that person, that soldier. I couldn't do it. And so my family always looked down upon me. That boy, you'll never amount to anything. And then they would hand me their shields and laugh when I fall over. They'd say, here, catch this. I'd catch and I'd fall. And they'd go, ha, 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 that boy will never amount to anything. And I worked hard working at lighting torches for the jails. I worked hard till I got up to the point that I could be a jailer. And I thought to myself, if I could just be the best jailer ever, if people could come to me who are in higher authority and would give me an instruction, and if I could follow it through to the letter, maybe I would continue the promotion, continue working my way up to the point that maybe I would even get a reward from Augustus himself. Maybe I might even be able to get some type of honor. And then, then my family would be able to respect me again. 
then, then my family, my kids, my wife would view me as a worthwhile person, a respectable man. And so when I was told by higher ups, here's men, keep them secure, put them in the most safest, secure place possible, guess what I wanted to do? Yeah, do it to the best of my ability. Doggone it. That's what I wanted to do. And that's, that's what I did. And so I put Paul and Silas into the jails. And I put them into the stockade where I knew they would be secure. Now I'll get that promotion. That's what I thought. Now I will show that I am a man's man, that I am worthy of respect and honor from my family. Then one night, and you know, here's the thing. Let me just kind of give you a little bit of a background on this. My house, here's the neat thing about the, about the jailer. Being a jailer is not a bad job because you're given property. Isn't that nice? You're given property. You're given a place to live. In fact, two places to live. It was kind of cool. You get your house and you get the bed that is right inside the jail. Isn't that kind of cool? Okay, so, so you get a nice place to live. And as long as you do your duty right when you retire or die, you get to keep the land and the house. And so it's a good deal, not bad. I see this as a way of providing for my family because after all, a good man provides for his family. If you can't provide, then you're nothing as a man. That's kind of how I looked at it at the time. And so I knew that if I could have this house and this land, I got it. I got it made. Well, one night, I was getting ready to kind of lay down and get myself some rest. I had my best men who were going to stay awake and do the night shift on guard. I heard something really weird happening. I heard people suddenly, they're, they're, they're singing. And not a lot of people, just a few. Paul and Silas, primarily, they're singing. And I'm, I'm all confused. Because why on earth are they singing? Who would do that? Because I'm thinking about it. They were beaten, treated as the worst of the worst of criminals and in jail and in prison are going to face a sentencing the next day and they're singing. And there's not just singing songs to pass the time. They're singing to their God. Now what's up with that? Who sings to their God like that? Because after all, how is their God worthy of their praise? Where was this God when they were being arrested? Where was this God when they were being beaten, stripped naked, and whipped? Where was this God when they were being thrown into the prison and shackled into the darkest of the dark of places? Where was this God of theirs? And as I was thinking all these mocking thoughts about their God having abandoned them, funny thing happened. God showed up. Suddenly, there was an earthquake, and I know earthquakes. Philippi gets lots of them on a regular basis. We're like the, we're like the California of the Middle East. Okay, so I understand Philippi. And so, so we get lots of, of earthquakes. And this one, this one was a biggie. This one shook everything extreme to the point that I, it, it shook me awake. Okay, so everything shook, and it was violent, very violent earthquake, very violent. I was very fortunate the ceiling didn't fall in and the walls didn't collapse. Structurally, everything was fine. But I did notice something when I woke up. I did notice something. It was very eerily quiet. I don't know if, you, if any of you fellow citizens have ever been inside of this type of, of a Philippian jail or any other type of prison like that. I'm sure none of you had the cause to be there. You're much more respectable than that, I'm sure. But nonetheless, whenever somebody moves, even an ankle and a wiggle, you know what sound you hear from that? The sound of chains bustling about. You hear the sound of people breathing and coughing. You hear the sounds of, of, of all the stockades being kind of tightened and relaxing because we make the, tight, the stockades far apart so that people can't hold themselves upright. And then we adjust the length of them to for extra torture. And usually you hear the stockades shifting and moving and bustling about. I heard none of that. It was in the middle of the night. There was this big earthquake, and then suddenly I heard absolutely 
nothing. And I went to investigate. And know what I found? Every door was busted and off his hinges. Every chain was off the walls. Even though I looked over and passed the ones where we had no prisoners yet, and I saw that the chains were no longer on the walls, but had fallen to the ground and shattered open, and the doors were all off their hinges, and it was eerily quiet. You know what that means? Everybody's gone. Because who would stay? Who on their right mind are going to be in jail, possibly a death sentence, would suddenly have an earthquake, have all their chains set broken free, and then the the doors ripped off their hinges and would just stay there and say, well, that's kind of neat. And it's in the middle of the night, which means no one's seeing them run. So they get to get a long way. And we took all their cell phones so you can't even see them ring if you call them. (laughs) And so, so we can't see them. So I'm thinking to myself, they're gone. Every last one of them gone. I failed as a jailer. I was given one task. That one task was secure the prisoners. I mean, how hard is it to make sure that a chained person stays chained? How hard is it to make sure that someone who's tied to a wall is tied to a wall? It's an easy job. Anyone could do it. And now they're all free. Failure! That's what was echoing through my mind. Failure! You can't ride, you can't fight, you can't keep chained people chained. Failure. Failure. And I knew what was going to happen. I knew they were going to blame me. Because you got to blame someone. I'm not, no, surely, surely the earthquake was not my fault. I hadn't even had Taco Bell recently. (laughs) So surely the earthquake was not my fault. But still the prisoners are gone. And they're going to have to blame someone. They're going to blame me. And you know what happens when a jailer fails their job as a jailer? One of two things take place. Either the jailer is um, executed and killed, and when after he's executed, all his estate and possessions are repossessed from his family, and they are left on the street homeless, broke, and humiliated. Or the jailer is found guilty, not executed, and as a punishment, all his estate is pulled away from his family, and they are left homeless, broke, and humiliated. You think, I'm going to be able to get a job after that. There's only one thing I could do. There's only one thing left to do. We have a rule in Rome and in Roman society that if a humiliated soldier or jailer falls upon their sword and kills themselves, their family gets to keep the estate because the punishment has been given in a noble fashion according to our culture. Sure, my kids are going to miss me. Sure, my kids are going to want to have their daddy around, but what good is a daddy who can't provide? If I can't provide in life, at least I can provide in death. There's two ways of doing this either falling on your sword on your stomach or falling it on your neck. I prefer the neck. That's what I think would be best. I think that'd be the most painless way, don't you? It'd be really fast. You just kind of put it right on the armor, on the neck, and then you just throw yourself to the ground. Surely that would be a quick death, a painless death. I can say I wish I would have said I love you to my kids one more time. I wish I would, if I had just known that they was going to be like this, so much I would have said differently. Would have kissed my wife a little longer. I can't wait. The soldiers are going to come. I can't delay because of that. If they arrest me and stop me, then that means they lose everything. This is the only way out. 
So with the sword to my neck, I got ready to throw myself to the ground. And as I went to throw, I heard a loud yell. Don't do it! I'm telling you what, something like that will scare a person. <laughs> because you're already in a really inconspicuous position at that point. I was really focused, and I pretty much thought that for the most part, I was alone. But I heard a voice yell out, stop, don't do it. Don't harm yourself. We are all still here. We're all still here. Immediately, I started calling for torches. Immediately, I had to see what was going on. Torch was brought to me from one of the guards, and we lit it, and we shined it out into the, into the cells. And you know what I saw in those cells? People. I saw all of them, not just Paul, not just Silas, every single last one of them. Every prisoner was still there, sitting in the silence, waiting. And I saw them. I couldn't believe my eyes. I fell to my knees. I was so, um, just so amazed. And then Paul came over to me and he lifted me up onto my feet. He started talking to me about this man named Jesus. He started talking to me about how life was still worth living because Jesus reigns and Jesus is alive and that God exists and that he's real and he walked in the flesh. And he told me that Jesus was the savior and that he had come to die and to rise again for all my sins that I might be saved. I asked the only question I could even think of asking. How then? Do I get saved? So Paul started telling me. He says it's simple. It's as easy as ABC. I was expecting ABG. But he said it's easy. He said you admit you're a sinner. And then you believe in Jesus Christ. And by believe it doesn't mean you agree with a certain set of facts it means that you believe that he is truly the Lord of lords, the God above all, that he is really the king of kings, and you confess him as Lord of your life, committing everything over to him. Yes, you're going to screw up along the way. Yes, you're still going to make your mistakes and your sin, and yes, you're still going to be in some people's eyes a failure. But to the Lord, you will be forgiven. You will be saved. You'll be redeemed. You'll be a child of the king. That's what you'll be. And I accepted Jesus that night. I fell on my knees and we prayed together and I asked Jesus into my heart and I asked him to forgive me of my sins and I committed him, committed my whole life over to him. And then I told Paul, I said, you need to come to my house. Uh, you have been mistreated. Long. I didn't even know he was a Roman citizen. I didn't care. He was a brother. He was a brother in Christ to me. And I told him, you've been mistreated long enough. You and Silas are going to come to my house. I want to wash you guys up. And I want to give you guys a meal. And when they came over, you know what they did? They preached to my wife and kids. And they accepted Christ too. My whole household. Take away my property. I don't care. My kids are going to see eternity in the kingdom of Christ. And I'm going to be able to walk the streets of gold forever with my wife. Don't, I don't care. Take it all. We're all saved and we're all child of the king. We have glories beyond property available to us. So if the Roman council chooses to take away my stuff, <laughs> find something else. God will provide because I'm his child now, not a, just a child of some citizenship of a country. After my family had all accepted Christ and we got done praying, I said, man, we got to wash your guys' wounds. You, you've been whipped. You've been beaten. You're dirty. Let me, let me clean you. And then the most amazing, amazing thing happened. After we got done washing them, they washed us. They took us out back over by the river and they baptized my whole family and I at one time. 
how amazing it was to go into the waters with Paul and Silas and have them baptize us. We were already saved, but this was that great entrance into the body, into the member of all the brothers and sisters in Christ, this great outward expression of this inward truth. It was phenomenal to be able to say, yes, I was once dirty, but now I'm clean. To wash, to just look at the waters and see the metaphor of my old self leaving and the new self being put on in Christ. This is what happened. It was absolutely breathtaking to have that moment. Here's the thing, oh people of Rome, so much has changed now because of this. So much is different. I no longer live my life afraid, trying to meet some economical level to try to meet some type of social, cultural st status quo. I don't have that fear anymore. And you know why? Because he lives. Because Jesus is alive, I no longer have to be worried about who's going to be the next ruler of my country. I no longer have to be afraid whether there's going to be a new, a good successor or a bad successor. I no longer have to be worried about that. I no longer have to be consumed about whether our economy is going to rise or fall under new leadership. I'm not bothered by that anymore. You know why? Because he lives. Because one day Jesus will return. And because one day he's going to set the record straight. And he's going to reign forevermore. So because he lives, I know that I can actually face tomorrow whatever it may bring. Because he lives, all fear, it's gone. And I know who holds the future. And I know that I and my family, no matter who's in charge, can face uncertain days. Because my hope, my trust, my faith is not in a political leader. It's not in an economic standard. It is not in any type of possessions or way of living. My faith, my hope, my trust is in he who lives. Jesus Christ, Lord and Savior and Redeemer. So Roman citizens and leaders, if you want to know about what happened at the jail of Philippi regarding Paul and Tarsus, the Roman citizens who were mistreated, you're going to hear about Jesus. Because the two stories are so interwoven, you can't separate them. And it's that way throughout the entire course of history because absolutely no physical power can keep Jesus in the grave and no dark demonic power can keep him from rising again because that Jesus is God and no one's keeping him down and no one's stopping him from coming again. And we have reason to live because he lives. Mm -hmm.